Well, last week we began a new sermon series called Better. And if you remember, we looked at a story in, in Luke 24 of two disciples on, on the way to the town of Emmaus. Jesus had just died on the cross, and uh, they, were, they were confused. They were disillusioned. They, were, they didn't know what to think about the whole thing, what to think about Jesus. Um, his dying on the cross really didn't fit into their version of the story. Um, and we talked about how easily it is uh, for us to get distracted by the wrong version of the story, um, thinking that Easter is about egg salad sandwiches for two weeks, right? Uh, instead of what the story is all about. Anyone still eating your egg salad sandwiches? No? Okay. But thankfully, the risen Lord, Jesus, comes alongside of these two, and he opens up for them this better version of the story. We see it in Luke 24, verse 27. It says, In the beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And I just would love to have been there for that moment, just kind of hearing all that Jesus had to say about what the scripture said about himself. Wouldn't that have been fun? Um, but just think about that, that Jesus can somehow be found in all of Scripture, um, which, which at that time was the Old Testament, right? And there are hints about him um, all the way through Scripture, the better version of the story, which is where we're headed the next couple of weeks. Uh, in fact, this morning we're moving from egg salad sandwiches to donuts. Uh, anyone like donuts here? Yeah, donuts are good. Uh, last week, and last week we talked about how to have a conversation about truth. This morning we're actually going to talk about how to pass a test. And maybe the donut has something to do with that, right? Um, how to pass the test. Um, I'd like to kind of introduce this topic that I think everyone can relate to, and that's about temptation. Temptation. Temptation is something that we all struggle with, right? <laughs> In fact, that's... that's almost kind of a joke because um, that's what makes it an actual temptation. If we didn't struggle with it, it wouldn't be a temptation, right? That's what a temptation is. So what is temptation? And it really isn't quite as straightforward as I think we sometimes think it is. Um, I, I went to the great source of truth. I googled the definition of temptation. And this is what I found. A desire to do something especially something wrong or unwise. A desire, an urge, an itch, an impulse, an inclination. And the example that they give was Mary resisted the temptation to answer back. I mean, does that sound about right? Is that a pretty good definition for temptation? I think it's not too bad. I mean, think of something in your life that you consider to be a temptation. Um, and is it usually something wrong or unwise. And I, and I think we usually think of temptation in this kind of category, right? Um, something unwise or even sinful, maybe, would be a word that we'd use. Something that we should avoid in our life. And let's just process through this for a moment. Using this Google definition of temptation, where does temptation come from? Well, according to Google, it's a desire, an urge, an itch, an impulse, an inclination. And those seem to be all internal words, right? Um, kind of infers that temptations can sometimes uh, come out of us, right? Come from within. Um, do we sometimes have desires within us to do something unwise or even wrong, <laughs> And as we discussed last week, I, we, when we're having a conversation about truth, I think it's important to probably bring Scripture into the conversation, right? So we know that Scripture has something to say about temptation, I think, right? Um, do we see any evidence in Scripture that would lead us to believe that temptation actually comes from us? Well, actually, yes. I don't hear anyone offering anything, so I'll just offer one, right? Uh, James 1, verse 13, it says, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. 
Then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. So you see it, right? And there are other places we can go through in Scripture. There are times, according to Scripture, that, that certainly this category of temptation, um, that, that it comes from within us, actually takes place, right? And I even think that knowing this temptation, knowing that temptation can come from within us, that, that actually is helpful to me, at least, thinking through temptation. Um, sometimes I end up blaming temptation on someone else <laughs> when it's actually something that's coming from me. I uh, noticed a post on Facebook this week from Terry. Um, yeah, I'm talking about you back there. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's sometimes when we get bumped, there's things flying out of us, and it's not sometimes them. Sometimes it's us, right? And that's kind of what we're talking about. That this temptation, uh, I think sometimes... Um, it's helpful to understand that sometimes temptation actually comes from within us. It's not someone else's fault. And yet there are other categories of temptation. In fact, especially in Christian circles, right? I would have ventured to say that most of the time we think of temptation not coming from inside of us. That it's actually an attack on us from some outside source. Say, even the devil, right? Is that true, do you think? Uh, So we're in this battle, we're in this war, uh, not with temptation itself, but with the devil, or we're with some outside source, right? In fact, when we succumb to the temptation, sometimes the devil becomes a scapegoat, right? The devil made me do it. That really is the reason why it happened, right? The devil made me do it. And in this way of thinking about temptation, we focus really on this enticing, this uh, seducing towards evil. And I think of maybe Darth Vader with Luke Skywalker, right? He's trying to seduce Luke to try to convince him, actually, that the dark side is better. He's not saying, hey, this is evil, go do it, because you're evil. But he's saying, no, the, this, this bad stuff that you say is bad, it's not bad. It's good, right? Or even the two voices that are sitting on our shoulders, that kind of mindset, um, one trying to help us towards good. The other one, what's the other one doing? Trying to help us towards bad, trying to get us to do the bad. But again, it's in this, this enticing way, trying to convince us that somehow bad is good, right? And I think there's some good scriptural evidence for this type of conversation. You, you look of Genesis chapter 3. <laughs> the serpent tries to entice Eve to do something, Right? to disobey God, to eat the fruit. You see it in verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say he must not eat from any tree in the garden? I mean, you see it, right? There's kind of a conniving part going in here, um, um, trying to convince. Did he really say that? I mean, would that really be what God's intent was, honestly? Um, even in the New Testament, we see similar types of conversations in Matthew 4 um, with Jesus in the conversation, right? Where the devil again shows up in the desert um, with Jesus trying to do a similar thing, trying to get Jesus to turn away from God. Um, think about it. Verse 2 in Matthew 4, it says, After fasting 40, 40 days, 40 nights, Jesus was hungry. <laughs> I think that's an understatement, right? He was really hungry. Right? The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. What's the devil saying? Well, come on, Jesus. You're hungry. Right? You haven't eaten in so long. Help yourself. God has built you in a way that you have the power to do this. It's not bad. It, this is good, right? The devil's trying to tempt Jesus to not do what God wanted them to do. And it usually comes, again, with this bad-is-good type of conversation, this bad-is-good type of thought process. But it's definitely coming from outside speaking, right? In fact, in Matthew 6, when Jesus is teaching his disciples to pray, he says in verse 13, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. There's someone else at work with temptation. And so Scripture clearly teaches, I think, 
to, to propose this, this case that the temptation can come from outside of us. And I think knowing that this could possibly be the case helps us in real life dealing with temptation. Knowing where it's coming from is helpful as we navigate life. But I think even more helpful is seeing the different difference in outcome and temptation when you compare even the greatest of the great heroes of the Old Testament with <laughs> Jesus. The Jesus of the New Testament, right? The, the better version of the story. We've already looked at Adam and Eve. What happened to them when they were tempted? They fell. <laughs> and we could just kind of go on down the list. How about King David? <laughs> well, he was this great hero. He killed Goliath, the giant. But yet when, when he sees a woman bathing, what does he do? He has her husband killed so that he could have her. <laughs> I think that would be falling to temptation, right? And don't even get me started with David's son Solomon. <laughs> I mean, if you start thinking about the heroes of the Old Testament, and they truly were heroes, they did not do well with temptation. They just didn't. Yet compare them to Jesus. Jesus was tempted on all sorts of fronts, right? The book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus was tempted in every way, in fact. Read with me Hebrews 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest, talking about Jesus, who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are. Yet he didn't sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in the time of need. <laughs> now before we get into all that that verse says, I think it's really important to kind of look at this and say, well, how cool is it actually to think that Jesus, Son of God, Messiah, the one that we go to for temptation, has been tempted in every way. Just as we are. I mean, what does that give us? It gives us the fact that he can relate to us. He knows what we're going through. He knows that this is difficult. And as this passage says, he can empathize with our weaknesses. So, of course, knowing that information... <laughs> it makes it so much easier for us to approach the throne of God, right? With confidence, as this verse says. He's been through it. He knows what you're going through. You can trust him with this, right? He can relate. <laughs> and by the way, do you notice the, what this verse calls the throne of God? Do you see it in the scripture? It actually says the throne of grace. The throne of God is the throne of grace. Think about that. What is grace? Well, grace is when we get something that we don't deserve. Um, getting help. <laughs> free gifts from God that, that we don't deserve. And, and I think we land on that side of the coin a lot, right? There's a lot of stuff that we receive from God that we didn't deserve. Good stuff, right? And... If we are willing to approach his throne, his throne of grace with prayer, talk to him about it. What does it say in the scripture? That we will receive mercy. What's mercy again? <laughs> Not getting what we deserve. Not getting what we deserve, right? And then we're going to find grace getting what we don't deserve <laughs> to help us in a time of need. Can anyone say praise the Lord? And yet Jesus is also the better way. He was tempted, and he didn't fall. So his wisdom, his strength, his power to overcome means a whole lot more to us than these great heroes of the past that tried and failed. And, and even be reminded of this, that at times we do... I think we'll admit this, fall to temptation. <laughs> and yet, even then, he's the better part of the story because he's our advocate with the Father when that happens. And even 
After that, he's our atoning sacrifice for any sins that we've committed. Look at 1 John 2, verse 1. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He's the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. (laughs) Try that one on for size, Abraham. (laughs) Moses, I mean, these are huge heroes of the faith. I'm not ripping on them, but Jesus is greater than Moses. He's better. (laughs) So when we face temptation from within, without, doesn't really matter, who should we cry out to? Jesus, right? He can relate. He knows what we're going through, and he can do something about it, especially as He has the Holy Spirit working in and through us to to finish this work that he started in us. Now, before we we finish up this kind of topic about temptation, I think I want to go into a little bit deeper conversation, and I hope that you'll follow me. Um, Sometimes I have these weird ideas, and it's difficult for people to follow along with me. And Wendy's saying amen back there. Um, Um. But when we're thinking about Jesus being the better way and handling temptation, I think there's one more place that we need to consider. Um, Yes, as Google tells us and Scripture confirms, temptation can be this enticement towards unwise or wrong choices um, that can come from within us. And yes, we see in Scripture that it also can come from outside of us. We have an enemy. But there's another way that temptation is described in Scripture. Um, Beyond this moral dilemma, black or white, wrong or right scenarios where where we have to decide what is true, um, there's this other category um, to consider. Think about this. The Greek word translated temptation in the New Testament over and over again (laughs) can also be translated test or trial. And a test can be more about about an evaluation, right? Right? and in a sense, it's, it's not this malicious aim at trying to get us to fail. It's not some trap to trying to get us to do the wrong thing. It actually is an opportunity to show that we know that we know that we know. <laughs> and I think in most cases, these kinds of temptations or tests are not true or false tests. They're not this black and white, wrong versus right kind of test. And oftentimes, it's not even about doing the right action or avoiding the wrong kind of action, as confusing as that is to our (laughs) Pharisee tendencies. (laughs) Think about the story of the rich young ruler. This is a very disturbing story in Scripture to me. Um, He comes to Jesus with this question on, on the test. What's the question on the test? Well, what must I do to inherit eternal life is the question on the test. And he thinks it's a true and false test. Actually, do you follow the Ten Commandments? True or false? Do you or don't you? It's black and white. Not a big deal, one way or the other. And Jesus almost seems to egg him on in this thought process. Verse 20, he says, you know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. So true or false? Do you do them? Do you not do them? I mean, what is it, right? And how does this man respond? True or false? (laughs) My answer is true. Verse 21, it says, All these I've kept since I was a boy. So he's basically saying to Jesus, Jesus, I have focused on being moral my whole life, and I'm really, really good at it, right? I've avoided all the wrong things, and I've lived out the right things. I mean, woohoo! I passed the test. I got this, but not so fast. Listen to Jesus' response. Verse 22, when Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and then come and follow me. And when he heard this, he became very sad, talking about the rich young ruler, because he was very wealthy And Jesus looked at him and he said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. 
Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard this asked, Who then can be saved? (laughs) That's what I'm asking. (laughs) I mean, that is the real question, isn't it? This response by Jesus truly has everyone there, their minds are swimming. Everyone here, your mind should be swimming. It's like, come on, Jesus, black and white, we like it that way. Just tell us what we ought to do. Tell us what we're not supposed to do. I mean, isn't that what the Ten Commandments are supposed to be about, right? If I follow these commandments, I'll inherit the promised land. And this guy, unbelievably, has pulled it off. I mean, how great of a guy, because, I mean, this guy's got to be it, right? How could this possibly be bad? I mean, how could, how could he possibly miss the question on the test? How's that even possible? But he did. So, so we hear the question, and I think we're all thinking it, who then can be saved? If a guy who follows all the commandments can't be saved? I mean, how does he, I mean, what are you even thinking, Jesus? I really think we have a, a couple of options to kind of think through this. And, and again, I'm a little bit weird, so go with me here. Um, the first option really is that there's this hidden 11th commandment, right? Maybe after the Ten Commandments were given, it's like, oh, 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 we couldn't get them all on those stones. We got one more. And, and so they come out with this 11th commandment. And what does the 11th commandment say? It says, sell all your, your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. That's the 11th commandment. And they forgot to include it in Scripture maybe. I, I mean, that's got to be an option, right? It must be something that he missed. But you know what I checked? <laughs> I don't see it in Scripture. <laughs> The second option in this is that, you know what? Jesus is just a total jerk, and he's just going to keep raising the level so that no one ever gets to heaven. Do we believe that to be true? (laughs) I don't. Or, this is not a true and false test. It's not a did you do it or not do it fact-checking kind of test, I think. And I really believe this is the case. And again, you're probably thinking, what in the world are you talking about? So stay with me here. Um, I would actually suggest that this is more of a multiple choice kind of test. And my teacher's in the room. Back me up here. Um, When done right, multiple choice tests um, actually measure the progress of a student in understanding the big picture. Um, it's not a fact-checking, get, know the facts, and you get the right answer. Um, it is an actual, you have to kind of understand the nuances of things in order to get it right, right? Less about facts, more about deeper understanding of the topic. And what the rich young ruler was missing was that eternal life is not about doing all the right things. Eternal life is not about checking them off as true, I mean... As, as true in his life, that he was doing all the right things and not doing all the wrong things, right? What he was missing was something deeper. Not the facts, but the heart. And Jesus was looking at his heart, right? Was he loving God with all of his heart, soul, mind, strength, his neighbor as his self? Which then... <laughs> if you have the heart right, would translate into living out the commandments. And again, this can be confusing, especially if we're still thinking about black or white, true or false, right? But this is not an either or true or false test. It's not a, are you doing this or not doing this kind of test? This is a test in progress. (laughs) Are you getting the bigger picture? And I would venture to say that most tests in life come from this angle, from this bigger picture, multiple choice. Are you getting, are you getting the heart of what's going on here kind of way? I mean, look at the Pharisees, for instance. Weren't they like the best 
group of people in the history of the planet at following rules and doing things just right. And yet they were horrible at test taking. Every test that Jesus offered them, every question, I mean, they just blew it. They didn't get it, right? They thought everything was just true and false. They thought everything was about fact-checking. Did you do it? Did you not do it? Kind of test, right? They didn't worry about the big picture. They didn't worry about their heart. And so I think it's more helpful (laughs) to think of temptations, or tests in this case, as a multiple-choice test. Now think about this with me. How do you pass a multiple-choice test? And the truth is there's a lot of science to this. In fact, Google it. It's really fascinating. I'm sure you won't Google it. So I'll give you a few helpful (laughs) hints here, okay? Number one hint in the guide of being good at passing a multiple-choice test. It's pretty obvious, actually, uh, and honestly would help with any kind of test that we'd run across. Um, And that's this. Know that you're going to have a test. (laughs) Know that you're going to be tested. Pretty easy, right? I mean, if you are uh, in class and you're halfway through a test and you're thinking, oh, I didn't know we were going to take a test today, you're in trouble, right? I mean, that is the point of this this hint. (laughs) Know that you're going to be tested. The Christian life, is it a test? <laughs> it's the ultimate test, right? Almost a whole life. But that doesn't mean that, that an additional pop quiz might not, you know, be added to the mix. In fact, in Scripture, I think we see patterns um, when pop quizzes might appear into life. In fact, one pattern seems to be that whenever things are going really well, you should expect a pop quiz, Right? I think we see that in a lot of different ways. I mean, look at Job, for instance. Having a great life, all of a sudden, whoa, what's that? Right? Know that you're going to be tested. Even think about Jesus in the desert again. In Matthew chapter 4, in Matthew 3, if you look at Jesus' life, he's had one of the best days of his life. He's been baptized. The Holy Spirit comes, and, and this voice booms from heaven. Hey, this is my son whom I love, and him I am well pleased. And Jesus is saying, Thanks, Dad. I mean, it's, just, it's a huge moment. And then what happens next? All right, clear your desk, students. We're going to have a pop quiz. Here it comes, right? He's get, he gets led out into the desert by the Spirit. Why? To be tested. <laughs> Second helpful hint in passing a multiple choice test. Prepare for the test. I mean, these are pretty tough hints, right? Prepare for the test. Know the material. And knowing the material for a multiple-choice test is different than knowing the material for a a true and false test, right? It's not just facts. When we're reading the material, what would be a good material for a Christian? Anybody? Yeah, maybe the Bible. That would be a good start. Um, And it's not just learning, you know... And, you know, Joseph beget and beget and beget and beget. And it's probably not all those facts. It's not, not the important part of the story, right? Um, it's not a true and false test. <laughs> a true and false test, again, is a fact-checking test, a black and white ch- test. You just have to know the material. <laughs> In a multiple-choice test, you're going to have to know some nuances. You're going to really have to decide between two really good options, do you ever see that in life where you're having to make some really tough decisions and it's not going to be obvious? You've got to study the material, right? And by the way, isn't it just so much better to think of trials and temptations as, as pop quizzes? I mean, I, I don't like pop quizzes. Anyone here like pop quizzes? But what if you actually knew the material and you knew the material to the point where you were going to ace this test? Would, would a pop quiz be bad then? Oh, yeah, bring it on. I'll show you, right? So if we know the material, we go into it a little bit more confidently. (laughs) And honestly, when you're thinking about a true and false test, it's so much easier to just learn facts. Multiple choice test, you really almost have to get into the mind of the teacher. 
What does the teacher care about? (laughs) What does the teacher want me to learn here, right? Does the teacher have an agenda to what they're teaching? What What are they hoping I catch? Now, some of you are probably thinking, wait, you're saying that multiple choice tests uh, are influenced by the teacher? That within those questions, they're actually trying to lead me somewhere? Yes. <laughs> you better believe it. <laughs> know where your teacher's going, right? Know what your teacher wants you to learn. I actually had a soci- sociology teacher in college. And as soon as I figured out where she was going and the agenda that she had, and I totally disagreed with <laughs> what she was thinking, I didn't even have to read the book. And I could pass the test. I just had to know the teacher. Now, I'm not suggesting you shouldn't read the book. Don't get that out of that. Um, You should read the book. But back to Jesus in the desert in Matthew 4. He's being tested. Who's proctoring the test? The devil is. He's the one standing as a teacher, right? And he says, come on, Jesus. You haven't eaten for 40 days. You're hungry. You've got the power. Make some yummy food. Why not? And that sounds like a really good answer to Jesus' problem, right? And yet, Jesus knows the agenda of the teacher. (laughs) He knows the teacher wants to trip him up, right? So it helps him. That information helps him to pass the test. Prepare for the test. Know the mind of the teacher. Number three, hint, play along with number two. When you're looking at the question... Make sure you know what the question's asking. What's this about, right? And this kind of sounds like a no-brainer, but it's important. Um, Sometimes when you run across those places where it says all of the above or none of the above or all above except for this one, I mean, those are nuanced, difficult questions at times, and you really have to know what they're asking, right? And then this number four hint, the last hint I'll offer you this morning, um, and passing this multiple choice test. It kind of comes from who wants to be a millionaire game show. Do you guys remember that? Um, there's this phone a friend option, right? One of the options was phone a friend. So number four is take advantage of your resources, right? So what are resources why might we have as Christians going through a test? Yeah, the Holy Spirit, Scripture, Christian friends, we've got options, right? And those options would help us eliminate the, the different possibilities, the wrong answers, and narrow us down so that we might find the right answer, right? So, knowing all these four beautiful hints that I've given you this morning, you got them in your heads? Because clear off your desks, I'm going to give you a quiz, and we're going to process through this. Let's make this practical. So this morning, we're going to just take a couple minutes. I'm almost done. For you, for you that are just going, can this guy just quit talking already? <laughs> All right. I'm almost done. Um, you like pop quizzes, so this is going to be good for all of you. We're going to look at two garden stories in Scripture. It's almost like they're designed to go together, garden stories, and designed to point to Jesus as a better answer. Um, and you know these stories well. We just actually looked at the first one, Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the trees in the garden. But God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it or you will die. (laughs) Which isn't exactly what God said, but we'll just skip that part. Um, You will certainly not die, the sermon said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. This was the test, right? So let's kind of work through this. Know that you will be tested. That's the first hint. Would it have been helpful to Eve if she knew that she was being tested? wasn't just some serpent who randomly came up and said, hey, right? (laughs) If she knew that it was a test, she would have responded in a completely different way. 
Number two, know the material which includes knowing your teacher. <laughs> what is there to know that, knowing that? Who was the teacher? Who was proctoring the test? The servant. If she knew the teacher, yeah, that would have helped her, right? Number three, know what's, what's being asked. And this is crucial for her. She actually thought the question was about her. What would make her comfortable? What would, what would make maybe even her more powerful, have a better life? That wasn't the question, was it? What was the real question? Is God good? Does God care about me? Does he have the best in mind for me? Will I trust him? Do you see how those are the questions that are actually on the test? Which I would say is the question on just about every test that we are going to encounter. So think about those questions. (laughs) Is God good? Does God care about you? Does he have the best in mind for you? Will I trust him? I'm giving you cheats here. You should be writing these things down, right? It'll, it'll help you as you run across tests. Number four, take advantage of resources. Who would have been a really good resource for Eve to talk to? No doubt, right? <laughs> how about God? Why wouldn't you talk to him? And let's just see how it comes out. Verse 6, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some, she ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her. He ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. They experienced shame for the first time. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves as if that's going to help their shame, right? So what was her answer to the question? Well, the answer was, God does not know what he's talking about. That's what she's saying. Or at least he doesn't have my best interest in mind. He was trying to hide this from me. He was trying to take advantage of me, right? I can't trust him. How do we know that that was her answer? By her actions. What she did. (laughs) Did they pass the test? (laughs) What would have been the right answer? Trust God, right? Right? And because Adam and Eve weren't prepared for the test, because Adam and Eve failed the test, it didn't just affect them. That's the one thing we really got to figure out with our tests. <laughs> that we're not just in this alone. We're, there's ramifications all over the place for other people, right? And their sin affects us. Now let's look at a, a different story. Matthew 26, another garden story. But I was suggests the better version of the story. Um, Jesus provides us the better way. Jesus has just had the Last Supper with his disciples, and he really actually knows that this is the time, right? He's headed to the cross. Matthew 26, verse 36, it says, Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. If I could speak, Gethsemane. Um, And he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. So what is he actually doing? He actually knows that there's a pop quiz coming, right? And so what is he doing? He's taking advantage of his resources. He's brought his friends along. Hopefully they'll be helpful to him um, and God himself, right? He's going to talk to God about it. Verse 37, he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Would you please stay here and keep watch with me? I need your help. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground, and he prayed, My father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. I mean, what's he saying? Please help me. I need help. And again, he knows the test is coming, right? He's trying to get his heart ready. Do you think he understands the question on the test? What was he about to be tested on? (laughs) What are the questions again? Is God good? Does God care about me? Does he have the best in mind? Will I trust him? Do you think Jesus was thinking about any of those questions? 
And really, even knowing the question, does that made it, make it any easier for Jesus? No. <laughs> Life was still hard. The test was still hard, right? But he was preparing for the test. Verse 40, it says, Then he returned to the disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? I need your help. He asked Peter, Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. You're even going to face a test, Peter. (laughs) Right? Spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. His friends really aren't helping him much. Come on, friends. (laughs) And he's talking to the Father, and and that's certainly a step that Adam and Eve didn't do. Verse 42, he went away a second time. He prayed, my Father, if it's possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, uh, may your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. Anyone have their eyes heavy when you're studying for a big test? I think I can relate to them, right? So he left them, went away once more, prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come. Son of man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. (laughs) Here comes the pop quiz. (laughs) What was Jesus' answer to the question? Do we know? Yeah, we do know, right? We know the rest of the story. He says, I trust God. (laughs) How do we know that? His actions. (laughs) How was he able to do that? By not focusing on himself. He was trusting in God's strength and God's love. And God gave him the strength to persevere. He evaluated the possible answers and he chose the one that the teacher was looking for. And it wasn't an easy answer. Very difficult. It was painful. But Jesus chose the better way. God's way. Trusting him with his life and ultimately his death. And because he was prepared and passed the test, God was able to deliver salvation not only... (laughs) to one or two people, but to the whole world. I mean, aren't we glad that Jesus was prepared for the test? That he passed. (laughs) So what about us? Have you ever thought about what happens when we fail our tests? (laughs) When we fail to trust God? What might be some of the hard things that come out of that. Would it ever affect our families and friends and co-workers and the people around us? What might be some of the positive results of actually passing the test? And again, not only for us, but for our families, our friends. I mean, we do realize that the way we live our lives affects people around us. We talked about that quite a bit at the Connect class yesterday. We aren't in this world alone. (laughs) We're in this together. We're being tested. Responding to the question of whether we believe God is good. Does God care about me? Does he have my best interest in mind? Will I trust him? And what forms do the tests come in usually? Well, it usually comes with some moral issue, maybe, that we have to make a choice one way or the other. Maybe some pornography came into our lives, and, or maybe other things, gossip, all sorts of different things, right? And we have to make a choice whether God's way is the best way or whether we think our way is the best way. Yeah. And how do we know how we answer those questions about trusting God? We see it in our actions. Right? We see it in our actions. Might even see it in the way we spend our leisure time when we're off work. I mean, could these be pop quizzes in our life? Questions of meaning and purpose, questions of trusting God, that He's good, that He's trustworthy. Um, 
Do we trust him with our lives? And yet we've got some really great resources that we can turn to. Jesus, obviously, certainly knows what we're going through. His Spirit can guide us. Scripture, we have friends and family. We have our church family, uh, the body of Christ. Will we take advantage of those resources? Will we cry out to God for help? Is God good? Does God care about me? (laughs) Does he have my best interest in mind? Will I trust him? Are you getting these questions stuck in your head? I'm hoping. (laughs) Our answers to these questions, seen in our actions, will affect not only us personally, but the people we love. Will we trust them? Would you pray with me? Lord God, I do. I'm so thankful (laughs) that you care about us, that you love us, that you're interested in us, that you have our best interest in mind. Lord God, we're also very thankful that you've given us resources to respond to the things that we see in life, our trials, our temptations, the difficulties that we find ourselves in. Lord God, we're so thankful that you offer us your grace and your mercy. A relationship with Jesus and you, God the Father. Your strength, your wisdom, your direction through your spirit. And yet, Lord, you also give us friends and family and church family, Lord. So thankful, Lord, that you offer us so many so many helps in our test-taking abilities. Lord, would you just help us to just consider that life is a test, <laughs> that the things that we run into actually show us what we believe, how we respond to them does, how much we put our faith in you, what we believe about you, Lord, help us, Lord, (laughs) as we walk through these difficult times today. Difficult things that happened this week, huge things. And yet, Lord, you're right there with us, knowing that these are difficult times (laughs) and that you will give us the strength and help that we need if we just ask. Lord God, Thank you for all that you do for us. And we will give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to give you a little bit more uh, help in knowing the right answer to the question. So I'm going to have these guys lead us in a song as we close our time this morning. If you'll stand with us.
to me. Let's sing this to him. Say, God, you're so good. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. You're so good to me. Do you believe that to be true? We serve a loving, good God that we can trust. And this week, prepare for the test. Work at reading through the material. (laughs) Work at getting to know the teacher. Understanding what you're being asked to do and understanding what the question is. Take advantage of your resources. The tests are coming. (laughs) So I send you in the grace of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. You are sent.